Hi, everybody. My name is Marco Roffi, interventional cardiologist uh, from Geneva, Switzerland. And it's a pleasure for me to welcome you on ePCR wrap up session The Power of Big Data for PCI in Practice. It is my pleasure to introduce my uh, two uh, friends and colleagues Bernard Chevalier, interventional cardiologist at the Institute Cardiovascular Paris Sud, Massy France, and uh, Professor Mamas Mamas from the Kiel University in the UK. We have uh, three important learning objectives today. Number one, we want to understand the value of big data from global registry in interventional cardiology. Then we want to explore difference in PCI practice across the globe. And finally, we want to learn how large registry data can impact our practice. So without further delay, I would like to ask you first, uh, Mamas, what is uh, uh, the value of large global registries today? So thank you, Marco. I think large global registries have a lot of value. We know that randomized control trials are recruiting very selective cohorts. Registries recruit real world populations, the sort of patients that we encounter every day in practice. I think that they're important in that they capture a much wider geographical spread than many randomized control trials are able to do so. And finally, they include many patients with comorbidities that are otherwise excluded from randomized control trials. So this is fair enough. So uh, this is a more general, uh, let's say, um, advice. So, but please, uh, Bernard, uh, tell us what is uh, uh, specific of interest what is the added value from the e-Ultimaster registry? We try to get the best possible compromise between quality and quantity of data with three important points. The first one is the quality of the monitoring on-site and off-site. The second one is to adjudicate all events by uh, clinical, AG, clinical event committee, independent of one. And the third point is to have a high rate of follow-up as we have more than 95% of follow-up at one year. So this is uh, really excellent. Uh, so, but uh, uh, you are uh, very familiar with uh, huge uh, databases. So how do you see the importance of uh, uh, like a 37,000 uh, uh, patient registry like uh, eAltimaster? I think it's very important. So my group has led the analysis of many large databases derived from the United States and the United Kingdom, which often are as large as six, seven million patients. However, these are administrative data sets and they don't provide information and particularly granular information around lesion characteristics, which is very important, um, particularly for studying outcomes in this population. I think secondly, these large registries also don't capture information around the type of stents used, and that can often confound interpretation of the analyses. I think finally, many of these um, registries only provide in-hospital outcomes rather than the adjudicated endpoints and one-year outcome data that the Ultimaster registry provides. So I think these um, two different types of data sets are really complementary of the type of information that you want to study. I think... One of the strengths of the Ultimaster registry was the fact that it was undertaken in many countries. So, Marco, what did we learn about geographical differences in this global registry? Yes, indeed, uh, really, the, the global nature, the true global nature of, uh, of the eAltimaster registry really allows unique insights in PCI practice ac ac uh, around the globe. Two thirds of the patients were from Europe, but we had uh, more than 6,500 patients from Asia, and we had approximately 2,500 patients from both Mexico and South America, as well as Africa and Middle East. So uh, interesting, for example, the, the age of the patient ranged between uh, 60 uh, years in Africa, Middle East, uh, to 60, 66 in Europe. Uh, the presentation is also very interesting because we had 55% of all patients presented with acute coronary syndromes. We had 35% non-assessment elevation ACS, 20% STEMI, 
So this is really something very important. And this was the case across the continents. Some interesting insight in cardiovascular risk factors of the population, maybe the most striking data was the prevalence of diabetes, ranging from 25% in Europe to almost the double, 47% in Africa and Middle East. The highest prevalence of smoking was observed in, again, Africa and Middle East with 27%, and the lowest prevalence of obesity was in Asia with uh, 70%. So these are some of the very interesting insights. Marco, did you find any major differences uh, between the countries and geographies regarding PCI practice? In, indeed, we have, uh, as you know, we have registry from individual countries, maybe two, three countries together, but it's very rare to have data on contemporary PCI practice across the globe. And this is uh, really something important and this uh, registry can deliver to us. So first of all, for all of us who are uh, enthusiastic radialists, the first good news is that uh, the overall rate of transradial approach was 82%. Obviously, there were some differences. The highest rate was in Europe with 88% and the lowest Africa Middle East with approximately 50%. In all the continents, the rate of transradial approach was approximately the same independently of clinical presentation, non STEMI, STEMI, or stable coronary disease. Intravascular imaging, rarely used, with one notable exception, uh, which is Japan, with over 90% of use of intravascular imaging. Sorry. Also very important data, dual antipated therapy at one year with some surprise for some of us, 65% of the patient with chronic coronary syndrome treated with, by PCI were still on dual antipated therapy at one year. So somehow more than what the guidelines would tell us, six months usually. But, and this is really concerning, that only two thirds of the patient with ACS were still on dual antipathy therapy at one year. And this was uh, the case uh, across uh, the globe. So Marco, I mean, you've described a lot of differences in terms of the demographic profile, but also the procedural characteristics in practice. Does that say anything about outcomes? Did you notice any difference in outcomes? So I have to say that the outcome overall of the study was excellent. The primary point, as you know, was target lesion failure, defined as cardiac death, target vessel MI, and clinically driven TLR. And this was less than 5% across the continents. The second important point for me, actually, is that the rate of uh, definite of probable stent thrombosis as one year was below 1%. And again, across the continent. Really optimal result. With respect to the predictors, and we'd like to focus on the clinical predictors, because uh, we will talk about later about complex PCI, but the clinical predictors, we could identify the five bad guys for TLF. They were acute coronary syndrome at presentation, diabetes, renal insufficiency, age, and previous revascularization. So Bernard, now I would like to, to ask you something. So you are obviously the man in uh, bifurcation treatment. And uh, what can you tell us about uh, the um, uh, bifurcation lesion treatment in the ELT master? You are presenting uh, as a late breaking trial. So tell us something about it. Yes, we have a very nice uh, cohort of uh, bifurcation lesion. We have more than uh, 4,000 patients still on at least one bifurcation lesion. So it's a very huge cohort, probably the first time to get uh, a so important uh, series of bifurcation uh, treatment. So we try to analyze uh, the role of uh, deployment technique on the outcome, particularly the role of proximal optimization technique on kissing balloon techniques and for Doing that, we use propensity matching to eliminate the confounders. 
And uh, clearly, the role of pot proximal diffusion technique was extremely important, and it's probably the first time we have uh, this kind of data. Pot is reducing by one third the TLF from six to four percent. Pot is reducing the TLR by forty percent. Is reducing by two thirds the risk of target vessel marker infarction, and also reducing by uh, almost two thirds, almost three quarters the risk of stent thrombosis. So the benefit of this simple technique is extremely important. On and the opposite- us, uh, Sorry, point, tell us uh, in what percentage of the patient was uh, used a pot? Unfortunately, it was only 34%. So clearly there is a need for education on that. Yes. But the so impact- That definitely is a, is a good message from the registry. And uh, there are people that uh, really want the real data and now they have the real data and now they will have to implement uh, the technique. Yes, the impact is very important. And uh, on the opposite, uh, the impact of kissing balloon technique is relatively limited. A small benefit in terms of reduction of target vessel MI, but no effect on the composite endpoint. And another good news with the Ultimaster is the fact that using two stats is not so um, bad in terms of outcome. There is no major differences in terms of outcome when you use two stands versus one stand. This is definitely something that speaks uh, for the stand. Yes, absolutely. So, so uh, Mamas, what, what did you learn from your research about uh, complex PCI patient in this registry? So thank you, Bernard. Um, our analysis was an analysis, um, one of the largest in the literature to date. And we use the definition of complex uh, PCI as advocated by the European Society of Cardiology, namely patients with multivessel disease, uh, greater than three stents, greater than three lesions, bifurcations treated with two stents, total stent length greater than 60 millimeters or CTO lesions. First and foremost, we found that one in three um, PCIs undertaken in this real world population were complex PCIs. Secondly, we found that patients with complex PCI were at greater risk of ischemic events, but interestingly, also at greater risk of major bleeding events. I think the size of this registry has also allowed us to gain more granularity around the risks associated with individual lesions. And so we also studied um, outcomes of the individual lesions and showed that across the board, all types of complex lesions were associated with increases in stem thrombosis, but there was a difference between the lesions as to the other endpoints studied. Finally, we also looked at um, whether there was a relationship between the number of complex features and outcomes. And it very much did appear to be a dose response curve in that the greater the number of complex features there were, the worse the outcomes were, both in ischemic endpoints as well as bleeding endpoints. And I think this registry is important for a number of reasons. Number one, it tells us that complex lesions are important. Number two, it tells us that the outcomes very much depend on the type of complex lesion, but also the number of complex lesions, therefore perhaps making us think about individualizing um, approach to these patient cohorts. So thanks, Mamas. I think uh, I would love to continue the discussion with you two guys, but I think it's time to make some, give some take home message for the audience. I think number one, uh, ELT Master Registry is to our knowledge, the largest registry of contemporary PCI, giving excellent result in terms of TLF, less than 5%, and stent thrombosis, less than 1% at one year. The results were reproduced across the continent. And uh, this gives you a unique insight in the possibility to detect differences in PCI practice, as for example, radial approach or intravascular imaging and so on. Bernard has stated that the excellent result can be reproduced also in the challenging subset of patient undergoing bifurcation treatment, as an underscore the value of POT to improve outcomes. And MAMAS reported that in complex PCI, while the overall outcomes were also very favorable, there was a strong correlation between the number of complex PCI features 
and the ischemic as well as bleeding outcomes. So I would like to thank you very much, Bernard and Mamas, and I would like to thank all the people who attended this session. Bye. Thank you. Bye, thank you.